all for being here. Thanks for reading me. Thanks to the school district and the library and all of you. Well, you're going to have some fun this morning because I just wanted to first say thanks for reading me and basically tell you I want to demystify this process of writing. This, that is to say, if you want to be a writer, I want to give you some inspiration. If you don't, I'm going to tell you some funny stories. Either way, I hope it's win-win. Um, I started writing, I guess, way back when I was young. Because in my house, we had very loving Italian-American family. Sixers, yes. We, we were very, very tight. There were a lot of meatballs. But in my household, there was one book. What do you think that book was? That's very nice of you to say that. I wish it were the Bible, but it was TV Guide. <laughs> Nobody in my house read any books. We watched television constantly. I love television. But I was a kid who really started to love books, and I found them in the school library. And I want to take a second to tell your school librarians how awesome they are. Please give them a lot of love all the time. <laughs> because I am telling you, it was a school librarian. And the school librarian called my parents in. And they said, your daughter loves books. You should take her to an actual library. And they did. My father took me to the library, but he sat outside in the car like a dog. What does that mean? <laughs> yes, no, I flunked. OK. So he sat outside in the car, afraid. I mean, he just wouldn't come into a library. There was no TV there. But I was a kid in the stacks, trying to how do I choose these books? I don't know how to pick a book. I was a little intimidated. And in my library, there were some books that on the spine. They had um, a guy in profile who had a really big nose. Now, look, I'm just being real. I have a really big nose. My whole entire family has really big noses. My mother likes to say we get more oxygen than anybody in the room. And if we breathe in, like, you could die. And it's kind of true. But uh, the guy on the profile had a really big nose, too. And I started to read all these guys with these big nose books because he felt like my Uncle Rocky. And then what did I find out? But the guy is not even Italian. His name was Sherlock Holmes. And that's why I started mystery writing. I know. It's not impressive, but it's absolutely true, like everything I'm going to tell you this morning. When I started reading the mysteries, I discovered a book that I started to love, which was Nancy Drew. I don't know if you've read her, but I think those were great stories. And part of the reason I really loved them was that even though she had a great girlfriend like I do, and a, she had a boyfriend, and everything was really great in her life to a certain extent, what was important about those books to me, and this is what I sort of want you to think about after I go, is that everything you read touches you in some way, whether you like it or you don't like it. What Nancy Drew meant to me was that she was a young girl and frankly, she was in the driver's seat of her car. You know, every author will write something, and there's a lot of details in books. We can't include every detail because you have a life, and you will be bored. We have to keep the pace up. So we try to include what's a telling detail. The telling detail is the one that will tell you something about the character. And I think if you've read Nancy Drew, you're thinking about the details of her life. The one thing you might remember is that she drives a blue roadster. That's important detail, right? Because she's in the, she is in the, she is not in the passenger seat. She is driving around having her own adventures. And I loved that about her as a little girl. And so when I got older, you start to go, well, gee, how did you become an author? And this is where I tell you it's not completely impressive. I, um, it was my first divorce. I don't recommend this. But what happened was I had been a lawyer, and I really loved it. But unfortunately, my marriage fell apart. My daughter was born, and I became a single mother. And I said, well, now I've got to earn a living a different way because I wanted to stay home with my daughter. Very, very much I wanted that more than anything. And so I said, well, you've got to find another way to make a living. Let's think about this. You love books. You majored in the contemporary American novel at Penn. You had Philip Roth. He's a great American novelist. You should try to write one of these. Because at the time, there was John Grisham, who's a terrific author, and a lot of other wonderful male authors. But there weren't any women in the leads. And I was like, I'm, I'm a trial lawyer. Can I, can I be in the book, too? Can I be a star in the book? And so I started to write that. It's because of Nancy Drew. And so I started to write those things. Now, I do want to tell you the real deal about my life, which is it's, there's a lot of rejection if you want to become a writer. You get to learn. You cope with it. My favorite rejection letter was from a very fancy agent in New York. He said, we don't have time to take any more clients. And if we did, we wouldn't take you. <laughs> oh. 
Right, exactly. You know I see that guy when I go to Book Expo in New York, which is this big conference where I was the keynote speaker. Afterwards, he wanted to talk to me. He's like, Lisa, Lisa. I'm like, oh, no, I can't hear you. I actually thought to myself, I don't have time to talk to anybody. But if I did, I wouldn't talk to you. Now, I know that's not super nice, but we're trying to, you know. I have, thank you. It is definitely real on that. If you look up real in the dictionary, there's me with a really big nose. So here I was, writing, writing, writing. How did I live? I survived on credit cards. This is another thing I don't recommend, but this is how it, sometimes you have to do it. I charged my life. If there was, you know, I had my daughter. We lived on, we, she could have books if she wanted. Um, what she needed, we charged. So we could, because we had these credit cards, that was what I lived on. Now, the weird thing about that is that it meant that my daughter couldn't have anything that required cash because we were that broke. So that meant that once a month we went to Chili's. You have Chili's here, don't you? Okay, so once a month that was our big treat. We went to Chili's. But the thing is, my daughter got used to Chili's where she really wanted to go to was McDonald's. But we couldn't go to McDonald's because McDonald's back then didn't take a credit card. Can you imagine? This was life before you guys. Like, you had to have cash money in a McDonald's so she could never go. Fast forward to the time when I actually get a book deal after all this rejection. By the way, I had $37,000 in credit card debt, which I paid back. So I am a good example in a way. <laughs> this is all in the follow your dream category. And, but when that happened, in the funny part of the story is that I had to take my, I finally got to take my daughter to McDonald's. She was delighted. She couldn't even believe it. At this point, she was six. It took that long for me to get published. So I was bringing my daughter to McDonald's for the first time as a six-year-old. She can read. She's in the lines. I have to show her how it works. It's not exactly like Chili's. There's the menus up there. I say, there's the menus, honey. And she looks at the menu, and she says really loudly, but where are the appetizers? <laughs> I know. Every head turns, who is this brat? I'm like, no, and she's not a brat. She, just, she doesn't know she's broke, which is how it should be. That's our job, not our children's jobs. And that's how I got into print. I finally got a book deal. And I, that's how you get there. It's not a mystery how you become an author. You just start. My little secret mantra was Nike. Just do it. We can talk more about that later. Now, where do you get your ideas from? For me, and there's a reason for it. The reason is truth. And you have to, you have to write something that really matters to you. And so it has to be something that is emotionally true. If it's fiction, it has to be emotionally true. So here's a quick story. My daughter grows up. She goes to school, college in Boston. I go to pick her up. And those parents of you will know that you know when you pick your daughter up at school, you got a whole big car full of stuff. And I have four dogs, so three of them are in the car, because one's naughty. And we pack all her stuff in the car. And she's got a lot of stuff. And she's got books. And she's got earrings. And then I see the cars that the parents of boys, they have like a basketball. But be that as it may, we have tons of stuff in the car. We're packing the car. We're about to leave Boston. She said, oh, I, I, want to, uh, I want you to bring my red rug from my dorm. And I'm like, wait, that crappy rug? Sorry, but th that's a word. Um, I'm like, I don't want to bring the rug. And she said, but I paid $37 for the rug. I said, well, I'll pay you $50 if we can leave the rug. <laughs> but no, she, and I'm a single mother, so of course I deny her nothing. We take the rug. The rug is on top of the car, on top of a box spring, on top of a mattress, and then the red rug, and then the bungee cord. You guys know that stuff. Like, it's civil liability on a stick. But in any event, we leave Boston with this crap on the car. And by the time we get to Connecticut, there is the worst rainstorm in the history of rainstorms. And my red rug starts to bleed. It looks like I'm driving a blood mobile. It's like Stephen King. This is me driving. People on I-95 are pointing and laughing. And the red, I don't know what color plasma is, but it's, it was coming down my windshield. And that happened for like three states. And my daughter and I, we just laughed. We were just laughing because it was such a ridiculous situation. Now, bear with me because there's a joke about Italian mothers, which I can tell because I'm an Italian mother. And it says, what is the difference between an Italian mother and a Rottweiler? And the answer is, the Rottweiler eventually lets go. Now, that's true of all moms, and I think it's true of all dads, because we love you guys, and we don't want any harm to go with you. And so we, I was starting to think about that my daughter was getting older, and I had changed my whole life to, grow, to raise her and be home with her. 
And I was having a hard time letting her go because she was about to graduate college. And there was an emotionality to that that I felt very strongly. And when I stepped over the threshold and I got home after this five hour ride, I thought to myself, you know, you're framing this question wrong. You're supposed to be a lawyer, and you're supposed to be a law professor, and you should know how to frame a question. And if the question is, how do I let go of my daughter, you're never going to get a good answer. But the problem with that question is it assumes your daughter is your property to let go, and she's not. We, your parents love you to death, but you're not their property. She's not my property. I just get to be with her. And as soon as I thought that, I was like, ah, oh, I feel better in my heart. And I said, that's a novel. The strength and the veracity of that emotionality became a novel, and the novel was called Look Again. Here's what Look Again is about on, on the top. A, a woman who lives in the suburbs comes home one day, and there's a flyer in her mail, and it's from missing and abducted children, right? And she looks at the kid in the middle, and the kid in the middle is her son, who's adopted. Right away, she knows in her life, oh my God, something, something must have been wrong with my adoption. She had no idea. She's completely innocent. Part of the reason I wanted to write this novel, because as a lawyer, I can tell you that in almost every jurisdiction in this country, you can put up a child for adoption without proving that it's yours. What? It's true. So I said, well, that's a book. So here you are on the first page, knowing that this character has to decide. If I start to investigate what happened with my adoption, I could lose my child which is the only thing that really matters to me. I can write that emotional truth. That's how I feel. And the other thing is, if I don't investigate it, and I keep this knowledge to myself, if I keep this truth to myself, and this secret, I will keep my child. The, that book became Look Again, all my books so well, but that one be, represented the United States on the World Book Night, one of the best books in the country. You know where it came from? The real question in that novel is, who owns a child? And it came from that stupid red rug. Do you see my point? It's not a mysterious, lofty, fancy thing. It's just your real life. Whenever you're writing, you're writing your real life. So I've written 31 novels, all are fiction, that are emotionally true, because I live them. And that's why they connect. I've also written nonfiction about my real life, which you guys probably write every time you post on social media. I know I do. Here's my dog for the 85th time. I like it. Because partly, at some point in my life, I started to wanted to write real true stories about my life because I felt like they were a lot like other people's lives in this respect. A lot of families are conventional in that there's a daddy and a mommy and there's a couple of kids. But I can tell you something, that growing up as a single parent of an only daughter, the first week she went to school, she came home from kindergarten not even knowing. She said to me, Mom, do you know there are kids in my class? where the mommy and the daddy live in the same house? I was like, oh, that's disgusting. But <laughs> the point is, there are differences in family. And I felt that acutely, because she, there weren't a lot of divorced kids in her class. And here we were. And I didn't know. And then I said to myself, you know, you should write that. Because partly I went to a library fundraiser in California. And people were saying, well, I'm divorced four times, and I have four dogs. And I'm divorced five times, and I have five dogs. And I'm like, well, I'm only divorced twice, and I have five dogs. So I have a little cushion there I can. Well, anyway, I said to myself, you know what, Lisa? You're not the only one in the world. That even though you're different and your family's different, you're not the only one in the world. And there can't be a more powerful message, but you have to write that. And like anything you write, it has to be true and authentic to you. So the first book that I wrote, this very funny series that I write with my daughter, who's 30, is called Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog. It's just because I really love dogs, and I started to notice that people were trying to make themselves happy in life. And whether these women weren't married or were divorced or were widowed, they were just rescuing, buying, acquiring dogs to be happy in life, which is the real point. And so they all became little stories. Here's a quick story about them that I wrote in the book. Became a bestseller. You can do this if you want. Story about my mother. My mother was a wonderful person, and she, when she got older, I said, you know, she was going to sell the house. I said, you can live with me. She said, I don't want to live with you. All you do is read and write. Uh, that's boring. And she said, I want to live with your brother. My brother's gay and lives in South Beach, Miami. That's automatically way more fun than me, because I live on a farm in rural Pennsylvania with a lot of books. She goes and lives with him. They have a wonderful time. One morning, she wakes up in Miami, Florida. It's quiet. It's a beautiful day like this. Sunday. 
she is completely convinced that she feels an earthquake. She jumps out of bed. She goes and wakes up my brother. Frank, Frank, there's been an earthquake. He's like, Ma, go back to sleep. She goes across the street. She wakes up the neighbor. Bruce, Bruce, there's been an earthquake. He's like, Mary, go back to sleep. And then she doesn't. She goes back inside the house, and for a reason none of us will ever know, she calls the Miami Herald newspaper, which is a major, I mean, this is a big time newspaper, and calls them up. Hello, my name is Mary Scottolini. She's 90. I would like to report there has been an earthquake. They're like, you might be crazy. She says, tell me your name, because my mother keeps a little list of people she hates, and <laughs> sometimes you bobble. It's like Newcom of hate. And, um, but then he says, what is your name? So evidently, they both have the list, which turns out to be an excellent thing, because five minutes, hang up the phone, my mother's pissed. Boom. Five minutes later, the guy calls back. Mary Scottolini, there's been an earthquake. She's like, I know. I tried to tell you that. You made me feel old and crazy. But what's amazing about the earthquake is that the earthquake did not occur in Miami. It occurred in Tampa. You guys are geniuses, so you know more about Florida than I do. But I can tell you that one's at the bottom and one's at the top. My mother felt an earthquake that occurred in Tampa in Miami. And because she was the only person in all of South Florida to feel this, they sent a news van to her house. <laughs> they put her on the television. Underneath the screen, it said, Earthquake Mary. <laughs> she loved it. My brother, who, as I mentioned, is gay, but unfortunately is the only gay man with no fashion sense, put on his best mesh tank top <laughs> for the cameras. You might be wondering why. The answer is, so he can see the map of Italy is, that is tattooed on his chest. He has a gigantic map of Italy. Milan is like his left nipple, but that might be too graphic for a high school audience. This is my family. I said, I can write about that, right? They brought the microphone to my mother. They said, how did you know this? You're the only person in all of Florida field. She said, I know these things. They ran screaming. Here's the other addendum to this story, which I also read about. Just told the story about my life. My mother, it was going to be a hurricane in Miami. I said, you are coming north, because I was worried. She was 4'11". We're all really short. We have short with big noses. It's not attractive. So I said, um, listen, you're coming north. She's mad. She gets off the plane mad. She was always a little like Yosemite Sam. She gets off the plane pissed. And they, they report, for some reason, there's reporters at the airport, because this hurricane was such a big deal. And the guy, reporter, went to my mother with the microphone. He holds the microphone in her face. He said to her, did you come north because you were afraid of a hurricane? She said, I'm not afraid of a hurricane. I am a hurricane. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying to you. I wrote that story. You can write that story just about something. Is it, aren't, isn't your mom a little bit of a force of nature? God bless you. Aren't you going to be when you grow up? Boys and girls, whatever, regardless of gender, whatever your reproductive organs are, isn't that what you're aiming for? I write a lot about my daughter, and she writes about me. So for example, she'll write in these books about the time when she was read the wedding announcements, and now she's 30 or something, and she would go, oh my god, they're 35. I haven't met anybody. I'm never going to get married. And the same week, I wrote an essay about how I read the obituaries. And I go, oh my god, they died at 75. I'm 63. Oh my god. you know. We're neurotic in the same ways. And then there's the time when my daughter and my mother are in the same house. You may have this experience with your grandmom. It's always vaguely combustible, because we're all three strong women. So we're all in my room. And uh, permit me, my daughter is reading the magazine. We love magazines. And it says in the magazine, you should throw your plastic razor ev away every three to five uses. My daughter looks at me, when do you throw your plastic razor away, mom? This is, is this TMI? Good, fine. I say, well, when there's rust going down my side, <laughs> she's like, that's not funny. I'm like, it's a little funny. And she, so then my grandmother comes down. My, my mother comes down, her grandmother, and she says, Grandma, this magazine says you're supposed to throw your razor away every three to five uses. When do you throw your razor away? My grandma, my mother goes, I don't have any hair. So look. Look at all you're learning this morning. When you're 90, you won't, this won't be an issue. But what's interesting is what she said next, because she got mad again. She says, I'm so mad. I don't know. What are you mad about now, Ma? I'm mad because my colander broke. My colander at home in Miami. My colander 
You know the one, Lisa. It's shaped like this, and the dots are in the shapes of stars. Well, the foot fell off my colander. And I listened to her, and I go, well, uh, uh, wait a minute. I know that. At this time, if I know the colander, Mom, that means it's a 58-year-old colander. And she said, I know, but I paid good money for it. <laughs> now, here's what I'm trying to say to you. If you think about writing, or in my opinion, think about living your life in a way that will make you happy, you need to slow down the moments in it and experience them and just understand the people around you and what, what is so wonderful about them. Because I was in that room and I said to myself, this is not a moment that's about plastic razors and colanders at all. That's only this part of the story. Where's the emotional truth of what's happening? Well, the emotional truth of what's happening is here is my daughter who is younger and the world now is throw it away. Just toss it. Toss it out, it's plastic, it's disposable. Now we're getting smarter about the oceans and all that stuff, but it's still disposable. That's what, that is the world now. But the world in my mother's day, the world in my mother's day was nothing should ever break. And I will tell you that older people who went through the Depression, who went through World War, I mean, you can't even imagine a time in this country. Probably your grandparents tell you the story, or maybe they're even too young. But these are people who were starving. My, grand, my mother will tell you the story of how her family was so hungry, they would pick cigarette butts off the streets of Philadelphia and sell them to eat. So that generation doesn't expect anything to break because they didn't break. And that's what's really happening when you look at the generations in your house. And so that's the kind of stuff I wanted to write about. In the novels, I'm writing about stuff that's fiction, but it is emotionally true. And in these funny stories, which, by the way, you can find every Sunday morning, I post one on my Facebook page at 9 o'clock. Read it. It's for free. You get the idea of how you can write them yourself. It'll help you in your English classes. It's 700 words of something funny that happened to me. And I bet it will sound a lot like your family. And all of those are literally true. And as a woman who's getting older, you know, I write about the fact that I, I'm going to speak to the older women in the audience. There's basically two of us. In fact, not on this side. In fact, you don't exist. But I'll speak for myself that, you know, it's a weird thing to get older, right? You look in the mirror, and you find your gray chin hair, and you realize you're turning into an Amish man. It's <laughs> like I plucked my chin for you guys today in the hotel mirror, and I hope you appreciate it. I want you to look really close if I meet you later. Somebody has to write about the, um, the real literal truth. And my secret thing is, my secret mantra is, if it doesn't make me cringe to say it out loud, it won't make you laugh. Because you have to think about why you laugh. Because the real truth is, it's the real truth. If I don't say the real, that laugh is an indication that I said something really true. The real truth, you might be wondering, why does it matter? Right? Whether it's, emo I'm making this big thing. Fiction's emotionally true, if it's any good. I'm writing nonfiction that's literally true. What is the big damn deal? Well, it is this. Books and the arts have a purpose. And that purpose is fulfilled when it connects us. And it's the truth that makes that connection. You know it from anything you consume, whether it's a movie, or TV, or Netflix, or a book. It, there's times when you're reading something or seeing something, oh my god, I relate to that. That is me. That's like me. That truth, I feel that truth. And that connection connects you to the book or the movie. In a book club, it connects the people to each other because they start saying, oh, I love this book. Why do why, I love this book? Because X, Y, and Z. And when you say because X, Y, and Z in the show your work category or explain your answer or please elaborate, you're talking about yourself. You're not talking about the book anymore. You're talking about what is in you. And you're, it's helping you get to that emotional truth that you can really feel on access to make something really readable and awesome and impactful and connective. That's why libraries matter. That's why your school library matters. That's why all the reading you're doing matters and anything you consume. I'm a big fan of popular culture. All of that stuff, take a look at the art of it. Take a look at the truth of it. See if it speaks to you and why it does. 
carry it into your own stuff because I swear to you, you can do it. You, ca you will not mess up your life as badly as I messed up mine and you still can set it right in the end that I'm exhibit A in that regard. So thank you very much for listening and I would love to open it up to questions if you want. Thank you. Ask me anything, you, you see I'm not shy. If you have a question, just please stand and we'll bring you yeah, the microphone. I, I can repeat it too, whatever you want to do. You want to? I think there's one over here. Oh, sorry. When your life inspired to keep quiet, also I love your jacket. <laughs> Thank you so much about the jacket. I bought it for tour. Well, my best friend gave it to me, she's here. Um, what inspired me about keep quiet? I'll tell you, and thank you for reading it, and for your incredible installation, I, I, I was so blown away by the exhibit and the posters and everything, and I'm really glad you read that book because I drive on a, that street every day in my life. It's near my house. It's a street near my house, and I was with my daughter one day, obviously she's older than the kid in the book, and I was like, we always yap, because we're always yapping, and I thought, I could miss, I'm a big animal fan, I love animals. I'm a vegetarian. I got too many dogs. I have cats, chickens, a pony. And I thought, I thought about if a, if a deer came out or if something, I would be, oh my God. And I thought that whole mix of things made me think about what if I were a parent driving a child. And the very first thing I did as I went to my local police station, because you know the scenario in the book is that the father claims he was driving. And I wanted to know how, if that was realistic, because I write, as I said, true stuff, but also I want it to be realistic. And I know my answer would be, you know, that I left open that question. A lot of my books are about justice and family, so that book had a question. What would you do if you're the kid? What would you if you're the father? A lot of people really love that book. Some people go, that father's a bad guy. You know, I leave it to the reader to decide, but when I went to the police station, I said, how realistic is it? Do you think that a father would tell would lie and say he was driving to save the kid. And the police officer said, every time we stop a parent and a kid, the parent says they were driving. And we're sure that that's not true. But we get why they do it, because we're parents and we love you guys. And you can see it was an honest mistake. It's really, and I love to explore, oh, crap, there's an honest mistake. But then it's compounded by the lie, and you see the, the box that they get themselves into. So that's really what inspired it, driving there with my daughter and thinking, what if that happened to us? Did, did you like the book, I hope? Please say yes. Please say yes. <laughs> I'm not the cool author. All the cool authors, they don't care. I care. I'm honored that you read me. I know you guys are super busy. I can't imagine what your schedules are like, so thank you. Please. Yes. You have one? Got you. You can. Okay. I like to write, but I get very excited, and you can tell that I'm rushing everything. Like the first page, I introduce the character, and then three pages later, I'm like in the middle of the story. How do I pace myself? Okay, so you heard the question. Let me tell you, I want to challenge something. Why do you think that's bad? That's good. I really, I'm going to be real with you now. I, these books, I think they move along pretty fast. I'm sort of, I'm known as really good at pacing. I'm a fan of pacing. I read tons of books. You know the books I hate? The ones that are boring. The ones that are boring. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to be boring. And I think that's a critical error. People, there's a wonderful author, Elmore Leonard. He's older now. But he says, oh, what's the secret to my books? I leave out the parts that people skip. We don't need to know the weather unless it impacts the character or the character would notice it. I think that's a very good thing. Um, I would not change anything you do. And if you, if you take nothing away from me today, except for the fact my jacket is baller, thanks to my best friend, <laughs> I want you to take away the fact that there is no right way to write. I don't write with an outline. Are you surprised? You, now you met me? This is the person who would have a child when she's filing divorce papers. Don't do that at home. Don't be that. That's bad planning. Okay, so what I'm saying is I, I start with the novel. Keep quiet. I said, what if that happened? And then I try to figure out what would happen next. I don't have an outline. All these interviewers, they go, oh, do you know how it ends? I'm like, no, I don't even know how it middles. How about that? 
who's going to say I'm doing it wrong? I'm doing it the way that works for me. And I can tell you that I've met a bunch of authors in my time. 50% of them outline everything. I know a guy who does a 400-page outline. Oh, my God. I could never in a million years. I'd be bored to tears. I think it would be like writing Mad Libs. I don't want to know what happened next. And I think if I don't know what happens next as a writer, that excitement, like when you said I get excited, that's awesome. You can't bottle that. Your excitement will come through on the page. I swear to you, I've been doing this for 30 years. People feel your tension and your emotionality. There's a sad part in my books. I'm crying like a little baby. It's like this, I'm such a good writer. No. <laughs> well, you got to feel it. So go, let all of that, the, 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 you know, the emotionality that's in you and the pacing, People, that's going to be what you write, and it has to be authentic to you. And as far as process goes, and you can find this on anything you write at school, Hemingway says, write drunk, edit sober. Now, I'm not recommending that. But his idea is this. Get it, I also say to myself, a little cleaner, get it down and then get it good. So you just want to get it down. Don't judge yourself. Do we have any th musical theater people? Where's my Sondheim fans? Anybody? Well, I'm going to quote it. Good. Kindred. Um, Sondheim is a wonderful, he's a genius. Here's what he says about the creative process. It's true of anything. Whatever you're doing, stop worrying if your vision is new. Let others make that decision. They usually do. You keep moving on. That's what you should do. You keep moving on. Don't listen to anybody. Don't listen to anything they say. Sit down. My other little secret is to since it's my job, I write every day. I do 2,000 words a day. That's a lot of words. That will take till 7 o'clock at night. Because partly I'm figuring out what would happen next since I don't have an outline. That's all right. If you give yourself a little word count, let's say you're going to write 50 words a day, 25 words a day. Do it every day, no matter what. It's a journal. It's a diary. It's a blog. It's a vlog. Whatever you want it to be. The point is that I do think your brain gets used to, you get over that hump of, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I suck, I'm stupid, I can't do that, because we all have those insecure voices, and you get out of your way a little bit, and you go, okay, now I'm going to write it, and the words will flow, and you start to get into a routine that becomes something you look forward to. I love my job. I get to do it every day in my house, on a farm. It doesn't get better than this. It just doesn't. So it's a great question, but it's not a problem. Yes, please. Um, my name is Maya Green, and I go to Hermitage High School. And my question is more about the front page of Keep Quiet. Okay. Was it intentional to keep it, like, it made people think that it was more of a love story, and then when they actually read it, it was kind of intense. <laughs> was that intentional? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think was going to be a love story? The guy with the girl, liking the girl? Like, with the couple holding each other, it kind of looked like there was like a situation with their love. But when you read the story... Oh, the cover. Yeah, the cover. Oh, God, the cover sucks. <laughs> oh, you know, that's a really excellent question. And here's where you find out that uh, I am really responsible for everything written in the book. Also, the flap copy. I write the inside that says how great I am. I write that to make sure it says <laughs> that I'm great enough. The picture on the back, as now you know, looks nothing like me. And, but the cover, I agree with you. I thought that cover was misleading. Um, it, I know. It was just, I know. I, but I don't, I don't make it. I didn't have approval of it. It does look like there's going to be a troubled couple. You're absolutely right. You should go to New York and tell them because they wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> yes. Um, I like writing, but it's hard for me to put my thoughts onto the paper. Do you have any advice? Yes, and I'm really glad to hear you like it because that's really the key. If you just like it. And here's what I want to say to you. It's going back a little bit to what I was trying to say before. What, do you worry that it's not good when you're putting it down? Yeah. And you know what? I have that feeling. I still have that feeling. And when you're a writer like me and they publish you, you can read a review. Generally, my reviews are really good, but sometimes I'll say, she doesn't do this. I'm like, hmm. You know, 
The key thing is, when you're writing, I like to say it sounds silly, but I think it's a little zen. It's be here now. Just say to yourself, it's good enough for me to write down. Like there's a wonderful idea where it's in a book called Bird by Bird, and that's a really good book about writing. And she says, give yourself permission to write something that's a really crappy first draft. So let's say it's bad. Nobody has to know. No, you don't even have to tell anybody you're writing. When I had all this horrible disruption, I'm going broke, I'm raising a baby, I'm a single mom, my life was a mess. I didn't tell somebody I was trying to write. I didn't tell anybody because I thought they might make fun of me. And when I did tell them, some of them did make fun of me. Oh, you get like that mean agent. Oh, you got that book published? Yeah. But if you just say to yourself, I like to write and I'm going to do what I like, life that's what life is for, for you to do what you like and to tell whatever story you want to tell. And as long as you just be in that moment and let yourself do it, maybe that will help you. Because I'm sure it's wonderful. And that's why I really was happy to come today, just to go, listen, I'm just a lady telling stories. And I sat in assemblies too. There's, there's nothing magical about it. I learned how to write in public school. It's as simple as that. Other questions? Yes, please. You say it, I'll repeat it. Save, save everybody running around. So, okay. Well, I'm Eden, and I'm from Hermitage. And um, so you said that you have a history as well. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that in Keep Quiet, Sam has the gun. Mm -hmm. So did you purposely like implement pieces of yourself in the play? OK. Thank you, Eden. So the question is, in Keep Quiet, Pam has a background in law. Did you implement, like, use p parts of your legal knowledge to inform that character? To a certain extent, I did. Because like I said, I like to write books about justice. And what is justice isn't a legal question. Sometimes people make you think that it is, but it isn't in my view. A legal question is a separate thing. What is justice is really a question of, do I think this is right or wrong? Kids in cages at a border. Everybody can have a lot of views about that. That is a justice question. And so every, I'm always liking to look at what is the difference between law and justice. We always used to think that law led to justice. But if you read To Kill a Mockingbird, you know that's not true, right? Because that was a trial and an innocent man is convicted. Law doesn't always lead to justice. Sometimes law thwarts justice. And in the book, Here's Pam, and she's sort of standing for law a little bit, and she's talking about the legal ramifications. She also has personal considerations, but at the same time, she loves her son. So I like, while you're trying to tell an entertaining story that has pace and excitement, you also are trying to give people a way to think about concepts like justice, because every newspaper, every TV you turn on, any headline you see on Twitter, I'm on Twitter all the time involves a justice question, which is really a moral question. So yes, I did try to, I could have just said yes, and then wouldn't have to give a big lecture, but it's such a good microphone. <laughs> yes, please, honey. I've noticed that my writing usually mimics the style of whatever book I'm reading. How do you find your own voice? That's a really good question. These are all good questions. You heard what she said. And that happens to me, too. Sometimes when you're reading something, you can start writing and you can write, you're writing in that voice. That's what voice is. Your English teachers probably talked about that. Voice and plot and character are really all of a piece. It's the way you tell a story. You can probably think in your head of somebody like in your family, maybe your mom, or your, somebody who tells a story in the way they tell it. That's voice. Now, that happens a lot when you're reading. Um, I, what I say to myself, I go back to this Zen, I wish I had a better motto, but I sort of say to myself a little bit, which is, because I love to read, and I read every night, and I read all the time. So I have to be careful, particularly with a novel that's very voicey. I'm talking to you like the way I talk, and it's the way I write. So a lot of times what I do, and this is a little trick, is let's say you're writing it down, and you're going back to my earlier advice, which is don't judge yourself, don't be judgy, just write it down. Be in the moment. Write it. Now, go back and look at it later. Remember, write drunk, edit sober? You're going to write down whatever it is, but when you come back to edit it, what I secretly do is a lot of times I read it out loud. Every book you've read of mine, any book you've read of mine, I've said, they're all an audio book, but every, I've said every word of those novels in my house because I want to make it sound more like me 
or the character that I'm inventing, who can be like you. I mean, all of the characters are to a certain extent have something of me in them. So I think when you speak it out loud, it helps you get to your voice. You can do that with any writing, you know, that's why you want to avoid using words that are kind of big or clunky or not really what you mean or sound bs -y or SAT. You want to talk, and that doesn't mean you can't pick the exact right word. I'm a big fan of diction. Try to choose the correct word, but it doesn't have to be long, and it doesn't have to be one you thought of. For example, if you're writing in a character, that ca it can only be that character's points of reference. I'll use an example. We talk a lot about outsiders in fiction, because a lot of outsiders tell stories. If you think of The Great Gatsby, Nick Carraway tells the story because he's not of that place. I'm really not from here, you can tell. I have this accent and I talk real fast and I'm annoying generally. <laughs> I went to the hotel this morning, beautiful hotel in Richmond. I wanted to eat grits. I'm excited. I'm not from here. So if I tell a story about me eating grits, I tell it as an outsider because grits is a very big deal. I'm embarrassed. The room service lady came. I said, I have to tell you, I don't know if I should put milk on it. Like, how do you eat grits? And she said, I eat it plain with salt and pepper. That's what I do too. The point I'm making is when you're also, apropos your voice and your authentic voice, part of it has to be your authentic character. So I can't pretend, I'm not gonna fake it. I'm not gonna pretend I know all about grits. I don't. When your character is in a room and they describe a room and they'll have to, oh, the auditorium. Now an architect will know this is acoustical tile. And, but if you're, if you're gonna describe this room, you're gonna have brick, and it has some wavy things, and then it has lights on a track, it, that's another way to keep your voice authentic. What is it your character really knows about? What's the character's age? What's the character's gender? What's the character's ethnicity? Where are they from? Do they know what grits are? Because a person who knows what grits are is gonna describe it differently from a person who doesn't. Does that help? Good. Just thought of it, because it's a good question. Yes. or something uh -huh. like that and I try to keep it with me but a lot of times I'm told I put in too much of something and too little do you know any other ways to like balance it out more well I I like what you're saying I mean I think it's in terms of balancing it out one thing I think is really good and I think it sounds like a mistake you're not making frankly is that when you want to have some mystery in something we all watch TV and we all watch, I'm insane with the Netflix, right? Remember, you have, a long, you have some time to tell a story. A lot of beginning writers will not put mystery in. So they have everything in the front paragraph. This is the person, this is what they think, this is what they do, this is how old they are, this is what they did. You don't have to do, I, I, I really, I like the idea that there is some mystery in it. Now, you don't have to tell it, by the end, the person should know. Like by the end, maybe you're gonna answer some questions, but you don't have to answer them in the beginning. Sometimes I think it helps to just try to, like if you have the time, and you write the thing, then give it like an hour or two, maybe even a day. I do that with my books. I say to myself, you need to let this get cold. Let it get cold. Then come back to it and read it like a person who never read it before. Try to pretend, because this is in the edit sober part. So now you're gonna edit, you go, I don't know anything about this story. Only know what this person's telling me right now. Is this enough mystery for me? Is it too much mystery for me? Does it answer it by the end? But I think your initial concept about getting some mystery in things is good. Think of all the shows. What shows do you like? I mean, maybe Lost didn't have a great ending, but it's bringing you along. Everything. I mean, what are you guys watching? I'm watching all the stuff on Netflix. There's a lot of mystery. Adnans, I mean, you're always, mystery is what keeps people interested. I write books people call page turners. There's a lot of reasons that happens. One is pace, another is characters that you care about, and another is that there's just enough mystery to go, if you notice at the end of the chapters, and keep quiet, for example, I'm always like, I'm gonna end the chapter on a place that makes you wanna turn the page. And that's what you're always trying to do. I'm, uh, I'm gonna make you come along with me, because I actually have to figure it out, and the surprise ending always comes as a surprise to me, which isn't really impressive, but it's true. Yes, please. Um, when you got rejected, how did you feel? Oh my God. When I got rejected, how did I feel? I felt terrible. 
I felt um, useless and dumb. I felt ashamed. That's the bad thing about rejection. It makes you feel like you had no right to even try, right? And that's what's wrong with it. It's, when I saw that guy, that's why I secretly was mean to him, because I thought he made me feel ashamed for trying. And that's a terrible thing. This country is about people trying to better themselves. And I wanted to better myself, and I had a child to feed. So it really wasn't very helpful or nice of him. And I said to myself, I'm just going to prove him wrong. Whenever there's haters, I get haters. You can read you know, the column I said to you that I'm going to put on my Facebook on Sunday. Well, it's published in the newspaper. There's a comment section of the newspaper. People say to me, don't read the comment section. I'm like, are you kidding me? I love the comment section. I want to see the guy who says, I'm ugly, I'm stuck up, I'm no talent. How do I earn a dime? They give me strength. I'm, I'm like Captain Marvel, man. Do you see that? Like She, she draws strength from that. You, that's how you just flip it on them. You know? You hate me? You're going to reject me? You'll see. In the end, he wants to talk to me. I don't have time. Let's take one more question. Yes. yes, I don't want to leave it on a petty note. I want to be a good model for you. <laughs> yes, please. I'm Isabel. I go to Herm. So how do you get past writer's block? How do I get past writer's block is the question. Writer's block is, is a little bit of what I was saying. It's all those internal voices. It's a, it's all the, vo right? Is that how you feel? Like it's the voice that says you can't do it or I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I can't think of anything. I don't know what to write next. It's not any good. And I just try to say to myself, this sounds dumb, but sometimes I, there's a lot, I do visualization things. I, I had 10 years of therapy. I'm a fan of all of this stuff. And so but sometimes I take the bad thoughts in my mind. I put them in a little box off to the side. Because it's very hard to say, don't think that. You can't help it. You don't know how it got there. If you go to therapy, you'll figure it out in 25 years. <laughs> but until then, you try to put it in a box. You say, I always say, I'm going to press on regardless. Yeah, there's bad thoughts. We have to struggle with things. And then, as he points out, you know, once you struggle with yourself, then you get to the outside world. It goes, we'll take a pass. No good. Rosado and Denunzio is another book. It's just been um, happily going to be a TV series. Another thing I wrote is going to be another TV series. I got a lot of rejections along that way. I, I just doesn't stop me. I just say that is part of this terrain. Rejection, haters, and also me defeating myself. But I just say to myself, you keep moving on. Just keep moving on and don't judge it. Don't judge it before you put it down. Just put it down. Fair enough? All right. Well, thank you very, very much. You guys have been amazing. <laughs>